Welcome to Renegade Inc. Whatever the outcome in Ukraine, one thing is for sure. The economic reverberations will be felt by everyone for years to come as the world divides between the West and a rapidly reshaping Eurasia. Michael Hudson, always a pleasure to have you on the programme. Welcome to Renegade Inc. Thank you for inviting me. Michael, um, sanctions, sanctions, sanctions is all we hear now. We're sanctioning people, the West sanctioning people back to the Stone Age. Uh, what are the unintended consequences of sanctions? Well, uh, one is to uh, serve very much like a protective tariff uh, uh, on the sanctioned country. For instance, when America made sanctions on European uh, trade with Russia, uh, Lithuania uh, dutifully stopped exporting cheese to Russia. Well, the result is uh, that Russia set up its own cheese uh, sector and now it's so fast sufficient in cheese. Uh, if you sanction a country, you force it to become more self-reliant. And uh, across the board, from agriculture uh, to dairy products to uh, uh, technology, uh, Russia has forced to become uh, more self-reliant and at the same time to depend much more on trade with China for the things that it is still not self-reliant in. So America is bringing about exactly the opposite of what it intended. Uh, its hope was to somehow isolate Russia and then be able to go after China without Russia. And instead, what it's doing is integrating the Eurasian uh, core, uh, Russia and China, exactly the policy that Henry Kissinger uh, warned against, uh, going all the way back to Mackinder a century ago that said uh, Eurasia is the world island, and Russia and China could be the, the whole world center. That's what the fight is all about. Well, American sanctions are driving Russia and China together. And uh, America has gone to China and said, no, please don't uh, support Russia. Uh, most recently on uh, Monday, uh, March 14th, um, uh, Jake Sullivan uh, came out and uh, uh, told China, we will uh, sanction countries that uh, break our uh, uh, sanctions against Russia. And, uh, you know, basically China said, fine, you know, we'll just uh, break off all the trade between uh, East and West uh, now. And uh, uh, the East and West are uh, the East uh, in Eurasia is pretty much self-sufficient. The West is not self-sufficient since uh, it began to deindustrialize and it's uh, heavily dependent on Russia for not only oil and gas, but a palladium and many raw materials. So the sanctions are uh, uh, ending up causing a, a driving a wedge uh, between the European countries. Don't, don't people who um, uh, apply these sanctions think this through? Are, are they so short-sighted that they don't understand that these sanctions are going to build further capacity within Russia, push Russia further towards China, make that economic alliance uh, concrete, and ultimately uh, you're not going to be able to keep the lights on in, in Europe? All the while... Um, underestimating the fact that from a food security point of view, take the UK, for instance, a net importer of food, uh, not, a, not um, appreciating the fact that, for instance, Russia, Ukraine, uh, they create 25%, a quarter of all wheat annually. The estimation this uh, year is 102 million tonnes, Russia and Ukraine, wheat. Don't people realise that there's going to be a massive knock-on effect Yes, they do realize it. Yes, they've thought it all through. Uh, I've worked with these people for more than 50 years. Who are these people? Uh, the neocons, basically. Uh, uh, the people who are in charge of U.S. Uh, foreign policy. Uh, uh, Victoria Nuland and her husband, uh, Robert Kagan. Uh, the people that uh, President Biden has appointed uh, all around him, from uh, uh, Blinken to uh, uh, Sullivan, uh, and uh, uh, right down, uh, right down the line, they are basically uh, urging the people around the new American century. Uh, they're the people who really believe, who said America can run the whole world uh, and create its own reality. And yes, they know that this is going to cause enormous problems for Germany. They know that not only will it uh, uh, block the energy that uh, Germany and Italy and other countries in Europe need, 
uh, through their oil and gas, but also it'll block uh, the use of gas for fertilizer, uh, upping their fertilizer production and decreasing their food production. They look at this and they say, how can America gain from all of this? There's always a way of gaining from what something looks to be bad. Well, one way they'll gain is uh, uh, oil prices are going way up and that benefits uh, uh, the United States whose uh, foreign policy is based very largely on oil uh, and gas. The oil industry uh, controls uh, most of the world's oil trade and that explains a lot of the US diplomacy. To, uh, this is a fight to lock uh, the world energy trade into control by US companies, excluding not only Iran and Venezuela, but also excluding Russia. So as Europe uh, pushes towards uh, more and more green uh, and renewable energy, um, and this for the Americans must be, uh, they must think that it's a dreadful scenario uh, insofar as uh, they can't sell the oil uh, as Europe becomes or wants to become more self-sufficient. So ultimately, and Britain net zero, whatever that means, uh, but, but going down the renewables path, going down the solar path, takes America's dependency or dependency on America out the game, doesn't it? This is exactly the point that the Europeans uh, public has not realized, that uh, while most of the European public wants to prevent global warming and uh, prevent uh, uh, carbon into the atmosphere, U.S. foreign policy is based on increasing and even accelerating global warming, accelerating carbon emissions, because that's the U.S. oil trade. Suppose that Europe got its way. Suppose that the Greens got what they wanted and uh, uh, Germany and Europe were completely dependent on solar energy panels, on wind energy, and uh, to some extent on nuclear power, perhaps. Well, if they were completely self-sufficient in energy without oil or gas, or coal, that America would lose the primary lever it has over the ability to turn off the power and electricity and oil of um, any country that didn't follow US diplomatic uh, direction. So when we take your analysis here and we think about how um, the sanctions are going to build capacity, push Russia and China together, when we start to look at sort of piggy in the middle, if you like, the EU, when we're thinking about America, the EU's had a sort of abusive relationship with the Americans um, for quite some time now, hasn't it? Well, it, that's, the, that's true in the sense that EU foreign policy has basically been turned over to NATO. So instead of uh, European uh, voters and politicians making their policy, they've uh, relinquished uh, uh, European foreign policy uh, to NATO, which is really an arm of the US uh, uh, military. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, Europe has had a decent uh, relationship with the United States diplomatically by saying yes, yes, please, or yes, thank you, by not being independent. Of course, if it were independent, the relationship would not be so friendly and decent. So for uh, countries that are net importers of food, need to keep the lights on, need heating and need cheap uh, uh, oil, uh, how does this pan out? What does it look like for the UK? What does it look like for the EU if this continues? Well, the Vice President Kamala Harris the other day said to Americans, uh, yes, life is going to be much more expensive. Our uh, uh, oil prices are going up and squeezing families. But think of the poor Ukrainian babies uh, that we're saving. So uh, take it on the chin uh, for the Ukrainian babies. So uh, they're told, uh, uh, basically, the United States is uh, presenting uh, horror stories of uh, uh, the Ukraine and saying, uh, if you don't, uh, if if you don't willingly suffer now by isolating Russia, then uh, Russia is going to roll over you with tanks, just like uh, uh, it rolled over uh, Central Europe after World War II. I mean, it's waving the flag of uh, Russian aggression as if Russia or any country in today's world has an army that's able to invade any under other industrial nation. All military can do today of any country is bomb and, and kill uh, other populations and industrial centers. No nation's able to occupy or roll over uh, any uh, industrial country. And uh, the United States keeps trying to uh, promote this mythology that uh, we're still in the world of 1945. Uh, and that world ended really with the Vietnam War when the military draft ended and 
No country is able to have a military draft to raise the army that's necessary uh, to fight to invade. Russia can't do it any more than uh, Europe or the United States uh, uh, could do it. So uh, all the United States can do is uh, wave uh, uh, warnings about uh, how awful uh, Russia is and somehow convince Europe to uh, follow the U.S. position. But most of all, it doesn't really have to. Europe doesn't really have a voice. Uh, and this is what uh, the complaint by Putin and uh, uh, Foreign Secretary Lavrov uh, have been saying. They say that uh, Europe is just following the United States and it doesn't matter what the European people want or what European politicians want. Uh, the United States is uh, so deeply in control that uh, uh, they really don't have much of a choice. When does the consumer start to feel this? When does the European or British consumer start to feel the pinch when these uh, sanctions are enacted? Uh, and what does that look like? Well, it depends on how uh, fast uh, the sanctions work. Uh, the United States said, well, in another year and a half, we'll be able to uh, provide uh, Europe with liquefied natural gas. Well, the problem is, first of all, they're not the ports to handle the liquefied natural gas uh, to go into Europe. Secondly, there are not a ship, enough ships uh, and tankers uh, to carry all of this uh, uh, gas to Europe. Uh, so Europe uh, is going, uh, unless there's uh, very warm winters, uh, Europe is, uh, is not going to have uh, uh, a very easy time for the next few years. And that's only for oil and gas. It, it's dependent on uh, raw materials that uh, Russia produces. For instance, uh, palladium is necessary for catalytic converters. Titanium is necessary to make the screws uh, that uh, especially are used in airplanes that are strong enough not to uh, uh, buckle when, and break uh, when there are, the wings go up and down and when they're pulled. Uh, Russia even produces the neon and the krypton uh, that are necessary uh, for making some kind of uh, electronic uses and also uh, for, for many uh, components that go into computers and information technology. There's a whole range of exports that uh, 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 Europe is uh, highly dependent on. And the United States has provided Putin with a whole list of these exports saying, well, okay, we're not, we're going to fight against uh, Europe buying your oil and gas, but you can certainly sell us uh, your heavy oil uh, that we need since we're not buying it from Venezuela. We, we certainly need the following list of critical materials uh, that we need, like uh, helium and krypton. Uh, and so uh, these are our pressure points. Please don't uh, press on them. Well, you can imagine what uh, Putin and his advisors are saying. Thank you for giving us this list of the pressure points that you're exempting from the trade sanctions. I think uh, it, it, if you really want a break in uh, uh, the wor unilateral, unipolar world, uh, I think we should break now and uh, see whether you really want to get along uh, without uh, trade. Michael Hudson, welcome back. Second half, Renegade Inc. Wonderful to have you. In that first half, we followed the money, if you like, talked about sanctions and the unintended consequences. I just wanted to um, pull back a, a little further, if we can, and just talk about the sort of tectonic shifts that are going on in the world. I spoke to um, somebody from Russia recently, and what he said was uh, very straightforward. He said, what well, now well, what we have to do is begin to learn to live without the West. Do you think that that sentiment is uh, proliferating across Russia now? Is that the mindset? Well, if you read uh, President Putin's speeches, that's exactly what's happening. And uh, uh, Secretary Lavrov has uh, voiced exactly the same feelings. There's almost a disgust uh, with the West and uh, uh, a feeling uh, from Putin, Lavrov, and uh, the other Russian spokesmen. How could we ever have hoped to have an integration with Europe uh, after uh, 1991. Uh, Europe really was not on our side at all. And uh, we, we didn't realize that Europe is really part of the U.S. diplomatic sphere. It's like all of Europe is now uh, backing uh, the attack on Russia. The best to do is uh, reorient our economy towards uh, China, Asia, and uh, Eurasia, and uh, become our own self-sufficient independent center. De-dollarization and the amassing of uh, plenty of gold by both the Russians and the Chinese. Just talk us through that. Well, Ross, you asked in the first half 
of this interview, how has America's sanctions worked against it? Uh, I should have mentioned uh, what you just mentioned, uh, the dollar. Uh, the United States just grabbed all of Russia's foreign exchange reserves. Uh, just as England a few months ago grabbed all of Venezuela's gold that was held uh, in uh, the Bank of England uh, when Venezuela tried to uh, spend this gold on buying medical supplies to cope with the uh, uh, COVID virus. So uh, <laughs> basically, the United States has said, uh, if uh, any foreign country uh, holds its reserves in the United States or uh, uh, accounts in U.S. banks, uh, if a country in the global south uh, tries to pay its foreign debt by holding its reserves in U.S. banks in order to be the paying agent on uh, the interest uh, due on its foreign debt. And if that foreign country does something we don't like, like trade with Russia or permit more labor unionization or tries to become independent in food, uh, we're just going to do what we did to Venezuela, what we did to Iran when we drank its foreign exchange reserves, or what we did uh, to Russia. Uh, and that means that other countries all of a sudden see what they thought was their flight to security, what they thought was their most secure savings, the holdings in uh, U.S. banks and U.S. Treasury bills, all of a sudden is holding them hostage and uh, is a high risk. Uh, even the Financial Times of London has been writing about this, saying uh, how can uh, the United States that was getting a free ride off the dollar standard for uh, the last uh, 50 years, ever since 1971, when foreign countries held dollars instead of gold, uh, uh, and basically holding dollars means you buy U.S. Treasury bonds to finance the U.S. budget deficit and the balance of payments deficit, how can the United States kill the goose that's uh, given it the free ride? Well, the answer is that other countries can only move into gold and is an alternative to the dollar because that's something that all the countries of the world have agreed upon is uh, an asset that's not a liability. If you hold uh, any foreign currency, that currency is a liability of a foreign country. And uh, if you hold gold, it's a pure asset. There's no country that can cancel it. The Americans can't cancel Russia's gold supply that's held in Russia, although it can grab Russia's gold supply if it were to hold it in the New York Federal Reserve Bank or uh, the Bank of England. So other countries are not only moving to gold, Germany is bringing its gold back from uh, New York, from the Federal Reserve, in airplanes back to Germany. So it'll have its old gold just in case Germany would, uh, uh, politicians would do something the United States didn't like and the United States would simply grab Germany's gold. The United States sanctions and it's uh, especially its grabbing of foreign reserve is a uh, uh, started uh, a war that is di dividing the world between the West uh, and Eurasia. A technical part to all of this, because let's face it, it is uh, an information war uh, and it's also an economic war. Is it that the fire sector that you point out, the financial insurance and real estate sector, is it that they uh, want to continue the exorbitant privilege of credit creation? Because ultimately, if you think about gold, there's no counterparty risk. Gold is gold and it has been for millennia. Uh, far from being a barbarous relic, by the way, now, people are starting to realize the intrinsic value, especially as crypto uh, falls apart. Can you um, just talk a little bit about this, the fire sector wanting the exorbitant privilege of creating credit? This is really what the new world division and global fracture is all about. You're, you're right, Ross. Uh, if you, you look at after World War I, the American fight against uh, Soviet communism was basically a fight of uh, industrial capitalism against the threat of socialism. But uh, after uh, 1991, and especially in the last two decades, uh, America deindustrialized. So the fight is not by uh, industrial capitalism against countries pushing their uh, uh, labor uh, up. It's a, a fight of neoliberalism against industrial capitalism or socialism abroad. It's against industrial capitalism evolving into socialism. It's a, it's a, a, a belief that well, now that America's deindustrialized, how is it going to control the world economy? Well, it'll control it through financial uh, means, by being the creditor, and uh, foreign countries' debt payments to America will enable it to 
uh, make its uh, military payments abroad and finance its trade deficit, but also America's purchase of uh, key natural resources will give it natural resource rent. Uh, its purchase of uh, uh, takeover of real estate is going to essentially make uh, the United States the landlord class and monopoly class that uh, medieval Europe had uh, to hold uh, the rest of the, the population uh, in serfdom. That basically is the uh, American strategy of neoliberalism fighting against countries that uh, reject privatization and financialization of their economy and specifically financialization uh, under uh, the control of U.S. banks, U.S. Uh, uh, private capital and uh, allied uh, satellite uh, banks and capital from England or France or, uh, or Germany. This is exactly the fight. Will, will banking and finance control the world economy or will other countries uh, try to build up their own economies through labor and tangible capital formation? Where do you stand uh, on that? What do you, and I'm only asking you to predict the future, Michael. Um, what uh, do you think, how do you think this plays out? Because what, the way you've depicted it is there's the rent seekers, the neoliberal rent seekers on one hand, uh, and there are value creators uh, on the other. How does that, and, they don't, and by the way, those two things don't sit very well together, as we know. How does that play out? Even though the United States is the largest debtor economy in the world, it's a creditor vis-a-vis -vis the global south uh, and uh, other countries, and it's use, it uses its creditor position to take over their natural resources, real estate, oil and gas, mineral rights, and public utilities, natural monopolies and, uh, that are being privatized from government infrastructure. It's, uh, it's becoming uh, basically uh, the landlord and monopoly class uh, of the entire world. That's the U.S. strategy, and that's uh, the key to why the world is fracturing globally. And uh, in the past, uh, the Global South countries were unable to fight against this uh, tendency in the 70s and 80s, the Bandung Conference on. But now that uh, China and Russia threaten to be a self-sufficient core in Eurasia, uh, this is the great threat to the American dream of becoming the landlord and uh, financier of the world. How do you think this pans out? Well, the question is whether the United States says, if we can't control the world, who wants to live in a world like that? Let's blow it up. Uh, the question is whether the United States will actually uh, uh, go to war. All that, the only lever that it has left uh, is uh, to drop bombs and to destroy and make the world look like Ukraine. So from the uh, US point of view, the, the uh, Europe's future and Eurasia's future is the Ukraine. Uh, look at what we will do to you if you don't uh, follow our policy. Uh, you, uh, America has just moved Al-Qaeda uh, very heavily into Ukraine uh, to sort of repeat in Ukraine and Europe uh, what it was doing in Syria and uh, Libya. And the United States says, this is what we can do. What are you going to do about it? Do you really want to fight? But the rest of the world, uh, certainly China and Russia, says, well, we're ready to fight. So uh, there's no telling what what you can do, and it comes down to personalities. Uh, Putin has said, well, do we really want to live in a world without Russia? If the United States is to attack us, uh, we might as well end the world. The United States says, do we really want to live in a world that we can't control? If we're not completely in control, we feel very insecure, and we're going to blow up the world. So uh, you have this uh, uh, countervailing position in a world where all of the arms control has been dismantled. Uh, by the United States uh, uh, in the last few years. The United States has withdrawn from all the agreements uh, that Russia uh, and China have tried to promote. So, uh, and Europe is standing by and uh, apparently is willing to be the sacrificial lamb uh, in all of this as uh, Ukraine is being the sacrificial lamb. So the United States and Russia say, let's fight to the last European. And uh, Russia initially didn't want that because it was hoping that Europe and Russia would have a mutual uh, gain in trade and investment relationships. Uh, but now uh, it doesn't feel that way. And uh, there may be a proxy war between the United States over uh, uh, the uh, European economy, not necessarily bombing Europe, but trade sanctions, energy sanctions, uh, the kind of disruption that Europe is going to be seeing in the next uh, year is uh, 
it, it, it loses uh, Russian oil and gas and minerals and uh, uh, also, I think, Chinese uh, uh, exports. Is there a moment where cooler heads prevail and suddenly the West and other places realize that they're dependent on, um, from a food security point of view, from an energy security point of view, that we are dependent? And is there a moment at that point that you can thaw a frozen conflict by saying, actually, if we both meet, if we just take a step um, toward each other, actually, we can do something in a collaborative way. Now, I get what you've said throughout the rest of the program, and I, I give this a percentage possibility of about 3%. But isn't there a, a, a strategy to say, actually, we've had all the grandstanding, we've had all the brinksmanship, we should now sit around the table and try and work something out? I don't see any cooler heads in the United States. The surprising thing is that here, it's the right-wing channel, uh, it's the Republican Fox channel, that's the only channel that's... Uh, uh, taking the anti-war stand uh, and saying we shouldn't be at war in Ukraine. It's the only channel uh, that's talking about, here is uh, how Russia sees the war, uh, the world. Uh, do we really want to uh, uh, take a one-sided perspective or do we want to see the actual dynamics at work? At work? So uh, the, it was the Republicans uh, and the right wing uh, that is now primarily against uh, the NATO war uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, the left wing seems to be all for it, uh, but the left wing, uh, the Democratic Party, uh, is in office, and I don't see any cooler heads uh, in the Democratic Party at all. Uh, uh, and I've known many of these people for many decades, and uh, they uh, are willing to go to war for a death. Uh, they're still back in the world of uh, World War II. Uh, when the fight was against the Nazis and anti-Semitism, they're still living in a kind of uh, myth mythology world, not uh, in, in the real world. And uh, the, the thought that the world can come to an end either doesn't have a reality to them or, as Herman Kahn said, well, somebody's going to survive. Michael Hudson, always a pleasure, a great insight. And, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, just refreshing to hear uh, such cut through. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you very much for having me, Ross.